How's it going guys, Chris here, and in today's guide we're going to be checking out all the main enemy types, variants and bosses you'll be able to find throughout Atomic Heart's campaign, from its bizarre looking retro styled robots to its mutated creatures and monsters, all of which are running amok out to try and ruin your day. One of the most common enemies you'll find in Atomic Heart is the VOV A6 lab tech. Basically, humanoid looking robots originally designed to assist scientists and carry out experiments in the labs, hence the name. Sort of resembling crash test dummies with funky moustaches, there's a few different kinds of lab tech units found throughout your adventure, which can be seen patrolling around, attacking humans on site using a variety of melee lunges, punches and kicks. Being pretty agile and potentially deadly enemies, despite looking a little bit like an angry bald robot version of Ned Flanders. The standard lab tech units shouldn't pose too much of a threat on their own, often advancing towards you, making themselves vulnerable to your weapons and abilities. Though it's key to know, along with being able to drop kick you and knock you down to the floor through charge attacks, these guys are also able to split their faces open and shoot out high powered laser beams from their mouths over range, an attack which is generally activated when you're just out of the robot's reach. The standard lab tech units have a white plastic shell, though you'll be able to find the strongest CH variants wandering around too painted in a black suit, while generally being tougher, more relentless, and more resistant to your attacks, along with your electrical abilities. These guys put up more of a fight, but basically function in a similar way to the basic ones, as far as their overall characteristics go. Though there is another variant to keep an eye out for in the game, one with a greyish colour that uses an electrical baton, while having a shield generator fitted to their left arm. Now these ones do play along in a different way, being more defensive while using several electrical strikes, able to throw rapid moving waves of energy in your path too, all attacks which need to be dodged to avoid taking damage. The yellow centre of their shields acts as a bit of a weak point, so it's probably a good idea to aim for that if you find yourself wasting all your ammo on that shield. A much more passive robot you'll find clinging to the walls of the game's environments is the Dandelion, basically a metal flower that scans the immediate area looking for potential threats. These sort of act like stationary CCTV cameras for enemies within the vicinity, alerting them of your presence if you accidentally wander into their line of sight. You can often hear these things before you can see them, emitting a pretty distinctive noise while they pan around from left to right, searching the area for humans. And they're also best typically destroying with your weapons, zapping with electricity, or just avoiding outright to save ammo, if they don't happen to be along your path that is. Not exactly the most exciting enemy in the world, but still one that shouldn't be ignored especially if there's a lot of other robots around patrolling the area. Another fairly common robot you'll see hovering around in the air is the WSP-9 Pacella, a flying drone with multiple different purposes depending on its model. These things were initially designed to repair other robots and deliver small cargo, travelling around the world via helicopter style propellers. Pacella bots are built with flexible probes, which can be used in both constructive and destructive ways, either as a close range stinger like weapon, or as a means to essentially respawn other robots that have been killed in the area, sort of rematerializing them like a 3D printer. Obviously neither of these are good things for you, especially if it means flooding the whole area with a pile of fresh robots, so if you see them heading over to some recently downed enemies, it's probably a good idea to knock them out of the sky. Pacella units with different colours indicate different attack patterns too, with the yellow models able to fire out a similar laser beam to the lab tech robots, blue ones doing all the repairing and close quarters stinging, and the red ones fitted with a dandelion camera, acting as a reconnaissance unit from the air. These robots can be spawned from pods on the walls, but also from huge mechanical hives found in the environment, and when they appear, you'll usually have to act fast to stop them annoyingly resurrecting all the enemies you've just taken down. One of the main biological enemies you'll find in Atomic Heart is a small floating plant-like creature known as the Sprout, a sort of experimental food source gone wrong developed using plant and animal proteins to feed and replace livestock. Just like most of the things in the game's dystopian world, these sprouts ended up becoming hostile, floating towards humans, only to attack them mid-air. They can be created by weird looking organisms in the wall known as mothers, which will often need to be destroyed to prevent them from spawning any more of their evil minions. Sprouts typically float towards their victims and attack through quick strikes, though the bright green ones are also known to spit out acid and leave small pools of corrosive liquid behind when they die and the bright orange ones are able to turn themselves into a flamethrower, and even throw themselves towards you when attacked, exploding with a small blast radius like a puny firework. They're really simple, straightforward enemies to deal with most of the time, but in larger numbers they can pose more of a problem, especially when there's multiple different variants all around at once, 
attacking you in different ways. Slowly floating towards you and attacking mid-air isn't the only thing the Sprouts can do, as they're also able to reanimate dead corpses on the floor, by essentially burying themselves into a host's head and taking control of their body. Nasty. This transforms that once dead guy into a violent, aggressive mutant, essentially a hybrid between the Sprout and a human, able to walk around using their legs or hover around in the air using those propeller-like Sprout leaves, emerging from the mutant's head. They'll attack you instantly and can usually be found in larger numbers, rushing and lunging at you from close quarters to deliver vicious blows. Mutants are given different abilities depending on what kind of Sprout they've just been taken over by, with some being able to vomit acid and others able to float at you and explode, just like those orange Sprouts. It's a good idea to try and kill the Sprouts hovering around before they have a chance to infect any nearby dead bodies, just to make life a little bit easier for yourself. Though there is a more advanced mutant type you'll be able to find in some parts of the game, simply called Large Mutants. These are a bit bigger and beefier in appearance, able to spawn multiple Sprouts at once from their backs and even lob them at you over distance like bombs. They function in a different sort of way to the basic mutants, using Sprouts as a distraction, while they charge around using brute force, soaking up a butt ton of damage, sort of acting like a bit of a mini boss. The Fat Rushka is another robot type enemy you'll find throughout Atomic Heart's campaign, a surveying monocycle system fitted with cameras, sensors, and of course, deadly ways to attack you over range. These things spin around on the ground, open up, and pretty much act like sentries, attacking humans in different ways depending on their model. Whether that be firing at you with an automatic gun like weapon, dealing sustained damage over distance, charging up an energy projectile which can also be fired at you over range, or even getting a bit more up close and personal, using a flamethrower type weapon to burn you to a crisp. Fat Rushka bots are fairly weak, only taking a few shots to actually destroy, but they do have a habit of moving around a lot to avoid incoming fire, often relocating to prevent taking damage, or to get a better vantage point to use their weapons against you. Potentially pretty damaging and disruptive enemies in areas chock full of other robots you'll need to take on, chipping away at that health from a distance, while some of the others act as a bit of a distraction. One of the more passive robots you'll come across is the RAF-9 Engineer, or Rafik, as they're often called in the game. A robot initially made as an engineering and repair assistant, but later got repurposed to do a bunch of other normal jobs, from being a janitor to a bartender. Engineer bots often act like servants to their owners, and can often be found on their own in certain places, typically keeping themselves to themselves, unlike most of the other robots you'll encounter over the course of the game, generally being non-hostile most of the time, Unless, of course, you decide to open fire on them, which they're not going to be very thrilled about, going a little bit berserk at you, with their self-defense systems kicking in. Despite being a bit clumsy looking, they can be pretty aggressive when they want to be, not only taking quite a lot of damage to bring down when they decide to go on a rampage, but also being able to use a variety of close-ranged attacks, throwing themselves around, swinging punches, pouncing at you, and even spitting out streams of hot oil-like liquid to try and hit you from further away probably an enemy you'll want to leave alone, unless you want to salvage some extra parts from them, that is. But if you start shooting at them, just remember that these guys aren't going to go down without a fight first. Next up is the MFU-6 Labourer, a robot built to do the job of a shepherd, basically doing farmyard work and controlling herds of animals in the fields. There's a couple of different variants of these robots, with the standard ones being fitted with a massive extendable circular blade, intended to chop down trees and assist on logging sites, but now, unsurprisingly, uses that blade for combat purposes instead, swiping at its victims in close proximity and attempting to slice them up. Labourers are fairly short machines which run around on two legs close to the ground, able to traverse rough terrain and withstand harsh weather conditions, which is ideal for them working outdoors. This does make them quite durable and able to pursue you relentlessly over the game's uneven rocky surfaces, generally posing more of a problem when they decide to hunt you down together, and attack in several numbers with those close range lunges and saw attacks, also able to lob those blades in your direction should you be just outside of the robot's reach. Some units aren't equipped with those circular blades, but instead would rather take you on from a distance, lobbing out explosive grenades and using a mortar styled attack instead. They fire these out from a turret on their heads and can be pretty deadly knocking out chunks from your health bar while keeping themselves at a safer distance, hopping around the environment by pretty much blasting the floor, relocating their position if you get a little bit too close for comfort. One of the biggest enemies you'll encounter, which is basically the game's first main boss, is a large surveying robot that's gone a bit AWOL, a heavy ball of metal with retractable legs, 
kind of looking a little bit like those things from The Incredibles. This is the Hog 7 Hedgy, a robot that can move around the environment really quickly due to its ability to turn itself into a tumbleweed and roll around all over the place. Originally designed to collect resources from the ground, but now prefers to cause carnage instead, destroying anything it comes into contact with. Because it's practically a giant bowling ball with legs, it's naturally going to try and run you over and pound you into the ground, rolling in your direction, forcing you to jump out of the way, while also using a deadly vacuum attack, along with being able to bounce through the air, casting waves of fire on the ground as it lands, which you'll also need to jump over and avoid. Being one of the fastest robots in the game, this makes its movements tricky to avoid and predict, with the Hedgy using this mobility to its advantage, attacking from unexpected angles. None of this is made any easier with it being protected by a heavily armoured shell, making your weapons highly ineffective against its outer casing. Thankfully for you, the Hedgy will eventually run out of steam, becoming overheated and forced to chill out for a bit, where its internal parts are exposed to cool down. And this is the perfect time to strike, shooting at those energy blocks to dish out significant damage, which eventually will be enough to put an end to the robot's rolling rampage, once you've destroyed enough of those parts. Probably one of the nastiest enemies you'll bump into on your journey is a freaky looking monster known as the Pliosh, an experimental endoskeleton creature made up of polymer muscle, which functions using an implanted dog brain. Unlike a dog though, these creatures normally stand up on their hind legs, typically using its long, extendable arms to lash out in shorter ranges. They're pretty fast and mobile, jumping around making them harder to hit, while using quick tendril attacks to smack you around and knock you down to the floor. Because the Plyosh constantly tries to close the gap and beat you senseless, you'll have to try and dodge a lot of those attacks, which can be foreshadowed by indicators which appear close to its arms, just as it's charging them up. The monster does happen to have one trick up its sleeve, sometimes able to pick you up, grapple you in the air, and basically attempt to eat you, which obviously isn't great for you. These attacks can be survived by tapping the right buttons, basically quick time events, but failing to do so will grant the Plyosh with an insta-kill, so you'll definitely want to win those fights. The best ways to actually take them on is by using fire and melee, with these creatures actually being more resistant to bullets and energy weapons, though shocking them is still a fairly effective strategy to interrupt some of their attacks if need be. As you'll see later on in the game, Pliashes are also susceptible to getting taken over by Sprouts, causing them to become more dog-like and run around even faster on all fours, which makes them even trickier targets to try and land hits on, while they use Russian retreat tactics to both deal damage and avoid taking it. The Luck One Owl, aka the Light Universal Copter, is another enemy you'll find flying around in the air, though unlike some of the others like the Vichella, these things are generally a lot more dangerous and faster moving. Although you can sometimes spot them in the skies transporting cargo around, their primary function is to keep an eye on crops and cattle in the fields of farmland, though now, just like most of the other robots you'll come into contact with, a lot of the Owl units are going to attack you on sight, zigzagging their way through the air to avoid incoming fire, all while shooting at you with different models being equipped with different weaponized attacks. Some of them will emit deadly lasers that can be really awkward to avoid, aiming them all over the place to try and cover a wide area, whereas others will be hit with high-powered rockets, able to spit out loads of them in long streams to deal lots of damage all at once, meaning you need to jump over and dodge said streams to avoid taking a big hit to your health bar. It should only take a few shots to knock an owl bot out of the sky, but because of how annoyingly agile they can be, this can be sometimes easier said than done especially when they're raining death from the heavens, forcing you to get the hell away from those punishing attacks. Kinda looking a bit like a dopey robotic ostrich, the Med-9 Doc is a robot designed to assist in medical procedures, from drawing blood and helping in surgeries, to treating patients in hospital beds, and administering anaesthetic via tanks housed on its body. Ironically, these things now want to kill the humans they were once programmed to help, and you can do so by firing out dart-like needles, which stick into surfaces, or yourself, only to explode and dish out some damage. This is typically their preferred way to attack, putting a bit of distance between you and the bot, though they're also prone to charging at you to knock you over, while also using those long spindly legs to kick out and deal melee damage up close too, giving them a few different ways to attack, from both short and longer ranges. Not exactly the most brutal enemy you'll come up against, being fairly easy to hit due to its larger size, but still one that can complicate fights especially when there's multiple different robots all attacking at once. Another one of the game's main bosses is a big metal chimpanzee known as the MA-9 Beliash, a robot used for installation, plumbing and welding, able to transport heavy weight quickly. 
The fact that this robot is modelled on a primate allows it to climb tall structures and reach areas inaccessible to humans to carry out manual work. But this also makes it a pretty manoeuvrable thing in combat too, with its outer shell built using steel and titanium for added durability, allowing it to soak up loads of damage and brush off a lot of your bullets with ease. Because of this, you're going to have to get ready for a proper fight, with it stomping around the arena, throwing its arms into the ground while jumping into the air and bopping rocks at itself at you on the ground below. A lot of its melee attacks can be avoided by simply dodging backwards just as it's about to throw a punch, though just like the Hedgy, the Beliash can also slam itself into the ground to create fiery shockwaves on the floor, which need to be jumped over to avoid being hit. Eventually, it's going to get fed up of soaking up damage from your weapons and resort to spinning its head on the floor to churn up some fire, basically giving it a close range flamethrower style attack, which can flood the area with fire and make that fight even more perilous, with you now having something else to avoid as well as the Belly Ash's physical strikes and slams. Not the hardest boss to deal with, with that massive head being a pretty easy thing to shoot at, but still one that will require a lot of dodging and ammo expenditure nevertheless. Easily one of the most sinister robots you'll come up against on your journey, the ARU-316 Rotor Robot is an agricultural machine with large scythe-like arms, used for cutting grass, harvesting crops and chopping down bushes. It can do all of this by spinning those blades around at a rapid speed, potentially making it a very dangerous robot, even before the outbreak happened when they decided to turn against the humans. Though now, of course, those sharp appendages are going to be used to slice and stab you in close range, with the rotor robot often charging at you from a distance, whirling those arms around as fast as it can to try and blend you into pieces. Those menacing looks definitely match their murderous appetite, being one of the more relentless enemy types you'll encounter, not only dealing a pretty nasty amount of damage per hit, but also taking a fair few shots to try and bring down too. Because pretty much all of their attacks are melee based, this means that they're going to pursue you up close and try their best to stick within striking range, a little bit like the labourers. So you'll need to try and act fast to put them out of action, dodging their lunges and doing your best to try and keep them distance, if you can. One really big robot you'll find in the theatre area is a heavy duty loader called the NAT-256, or Natasha, basically a big clumsy walking tank. Because of this robot's sheer size and weight, this makes it pretty easy to land shots on, plodding around the arena quite slowly while being such a large target to hit, occasionally hovering around to relocate using thruster rockets to lift itself into the air. What Natasha lacks in mobility though, it sure makes up for in durability and power, taking tons of damage to bring down while also being armed with quite a few deadly weapons to match yours. Aside from throwing its weight around to crush you into the floor, the Natasha bot's equipped with a missile barrage larger along with extendable arms which it uses to swing around and slam into the ground. All things that can simply be dodged and sidestepped but still give the robot opportunities to knock down your health from multiple different ranges. Once you've whittled that health down enough, in one last ditch effort to try and take you down, the Natasha bot will shoot off into the air and start raining explosive mines on you from above. Although you can shoot at these mines to detonate them, the smarter thing to do would be to pick them up and lock them back using the robot's own weapons against it while allowing you to save on ammo and finish the fight really quickly and easily. Definitely one of the coolest enemies you'll run into later on in the game, you'll eventually have a boss fight with a huge bionic spider-like creature called the Dewdrop, basically a robotic shell with multiple legs controlled by polymer muscle inside, making it a bit of a hybrid between a machine and organic matter. This thing could be used in mining operations, lifting heavy loads, while using a high powered mechanical laser in its eye to drill holes. With that laser being such a dangerous tool, it's no surprise that the Dewdrop uses it as a primary weapon, mostly attacking you by sweeping that laser around, sapping you over range, while jumping and rolling around to relocate and dodge incoming fire. It'll also throw its arms at you to dish out impact damage if you get too close, giving it quite a few different ways to attack, despite mainly using that laser which you'll need to sidestep, duck under and jump over, depending on its trajectory. Unlike other enemies, the Dewdrop isn't particularly vulnerable to any specific kind of weapon or elemental power, making it a very durable opponent, though your beefier weapons like the Fat Boy and Railgun are still going to come in quite useful to knock out larger chunks of its health. Round about midway through the fight, the Dewdrop's polymer muscle is going to start to leak out from cracks and vents, giving it even longer arms which can extend to strike you down over a further range. Although it'll become fatigued during this stage, resting more often, thus making it more vulnerable, it'll still be pretty pissed off, using a combination of laser attacks and arm strikes until you can whittle down the rest of its health and finish it off for good that is. 
So last of all, at the very end of the story, you're going to have a fight with a pair of robotic ballerina bodyguards known as the Twins, aka left and right. Although you'll encounter these over the course of the game during cutscenes, you'll now have to take them on in two phases, with the first one putting you up against left individually, and then not long after, the both of them in a big arena based fight together. One different element to the Twins from the other enemies and bosses is that they also have an energy meter, which builds up over time, giving them access to stronger special attacks. Upon entering combat mode, the Twins are going to extend their knife-like nails, giving them very deadly close-range melee attacks, which is going to be the main thing to dodge during the first phase against left. She's going to use agility and speed against you, spinning and diving around to dodge your bullets, while closing the distance for those nasty melee strikes, occasionally zapping you with a laser like the Laptech bots. Though eventually during the same fight, she's going to switch stances to a crawling position and scurry around at a rapid pace like a supercharged bug or while trying to hit you with those energy strikes and kicks, being even more awkward to hit than before. Finishing this phase will force Left to shoot off into the ceiling, ready for you to go upstairs for the second part of the fight against them both. This is obviously the trickier part, with you now having two powerful enemies with different attack patterns to think about at once. Left is going to resort to a lot of similar melee and laser strikes from the first phase, while Right is going to hover above, choosing to assist from a distance, by lobbing balls of super hot polymer, along with using laser and energy attacks as well so lots of things to eat away at your health bar. Having quite a lot of stuff to dodge and jump away from definitely makes this one of the harder fights in the game, with the twins also being able to combine their powers to refract loads of lasers all around the room at once. This will also happen when you've depleted enough health, becoming a last ditch attempt to try and take you down, and if you survive this final attack, you'll finish the fight with the twins taking themselves down with a huge implosion of energy. Job done. So those are all the main enemy types and bosses you can expect to run into and fight over the course of Atomic Heart's campaign. Thanks for watching folks, hope you enjoyed the guide, give me a thumbs up if you did, and be sure to subscribe and check out more content on my channel if you want to see other videos just like this. Take it easy, and I'll be seeing you in that next one.